I'm Bill Summers, uh, a member of the Terry Lectureship uh, Committee and Professor of History of Science and Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry. And uh, it's my pleasure today to uh, welcome you to the third uh, of four lectures on Jefferson and Darwin, Science and Religion in Troubled Times uh, by our distinguished Terry Lecturer, uh, Professor Keith Thompson. In the first two lectures, uh, Professor Thompson gave us an intimate and illuminating view of two of the great thinkers of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, Thomas Jefferson and Charles Darwin, as they struggled to resolve and, if possible, reconcile their personal views uh, of the new scientific discoveries and their religious beliefs, um, made an interesting story. Uh, while we only have indirect evidence um, uh, of the inclinations uh, and motivations of Dwight Terry, the founder of these lectures, um, I would venture to suggest that he too struggled to put his own thoughts into some consist consistent framework. Uh, in the state statement of purpose which endowed these lectures, he said, quote, it is by building on the truths of science and philosophy into the structure of a broadened and purifying religion through a series of lectures to be given by men, and I think uh, had he lived in our times, he certainly would have added, and women, uh, eminent in their respective departments on topics which have an important bearing on the subject, all the great laws of nature, especially of evolution, that mankind may be helped to attain its highest possible welfare and happiness upon this earth. Uh, it may have been discussions between scientists and theologians, such as we will hear about today, that Mr. Terry came to believe in the values uh, of such colloquy. Um, it was at a scientific meeting uh, in June 1860 at the Oxford University Museum of Natural Science that the talks that came to be known as the Oxford Evolution Debate took place. These talks involved, among others, two famous individuals, uh, Bishop Samuel so Soapy Sam Wilberforce and Thomas Darwin's bulldog Huxley. Uh, sounds a bit like a pro wrestling match, doesn't it? Um, they faced off in a critique of Darwin's uh, evolution only seven months after the publication of The Origin. Uh, the debate is best remembered today for a heated exchange in which Wilberforce supposedly asked Huxley whether it was through his grandfather or his grandmother that he claimed descent from the monkey. Um, interestingly, um, a historian of, of uh, this uh, event um, said that uh, in spite of this uh, high Victorian uh, rhetoric, uh, afterwards, uh, everyone enjoyed himself immensely and all went cheerfully to dinner together afterwards. Um, I would uh, hope we could uh, uh, recapitulate a little bit of that and I'd invite you after the lecture to join us for a reception just down the hall uh, after the lecture. Uh, today's lecture, I'm sure, will expose even more fireworks uh, and is entitled Apes and Academics, Debates and Sermons, and I'm very honored to introduce to you Professor Keith Thompson for the third Terry Lecture of 2012. Thanks, Phil. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I'm sorry about the hiatus between lectures two and three. I'm reminded of a letter I got um, some years ago from an undergraduate from Franklin and Marshall College who wanted a copy of a paper that I'd written. And he wrote, Dear Professor Thompson, I have just discovered you are still alive. <laughs> so it's such a pleasure <laughs> to be back here <laughs> to continue these lectures. And I want to express my thanks really to the Terry Committee and also to Laura Lee Field and the Secretary's Office for being so flexible and accommodating and generous. <laughs> dealing with my little problems. So where were we? I was, uh, I set out to look at the relationship between science and religion, um, which is always thought of as being in conflict, um, trying to s find a slightly new approach uh, to this subject with the hope that if you could find out where the problems lie, you might look at them in a new way. And this will, we might slowly get there by the end of the fourth lecture. Uh, my main thesis from the beginning, and I'll continue to is with this, is that any such conflict, like the conflict between science and religion, is really only an example of a much wider and more general phenomenon, which is what happens when anything new runs up against any kind of convention or authority. It certainly isn't 
confined to science and religion. And if we think of it as part of a, an example of a general phenomenon, that helps a little too. And one of the uh, attributes of this general problem is that new knowledge and authority always change at different rates. Uh, and authority almost always and necessarily uh, moves slower than new ideas accumulate. It doesn't always happen that way, but it, but it mostly does. Now, in my first two talks, I, I, I concentrated on individuals because it seems to me very important that this relationship between science and religion is expressed first and felt first and hardest uh, by individuals as they tackle the problem of learning something for the new time. And I, I gave the example that, interesting as the image of Galileo before the tribunal might be, think about how fascinating it would be to be sitting at his desk with him when he started to read Copernicus and Kepler for the first time and realized that his whole worldview and everybody else's was going to be thrown into disarray. Now, most people confronted with a challenge like that might uh, put it on one side for a little while. Um, some might choose to deny it and some might choose to devise some clever way of dealing with it uh, of the sort that we call saving the phenomenon. Um, but it takes a brave soul to tackle things head on. In my first talk, I talked about Jefferson, how he found that his growing understanding of the geological processes that shaped the earth became in conflict with the theological notion that God had created the earth all in one instant. And in the end, he went with his religious view rather than what he knew to be the case from his own geological observations. And in my second talk, I talked a little bit about how Charles Darwin, uh, when it came to the second edition of The Origin of Species, only a couple of months after the first, um, revised it so as to accommodate religious opinion, and then, as I said, bitterly, bitterly regretted having done so. Now, an interesting question came up with The Origin of Species very soon after it was published. Uh, was it a scientific work or a theological work? Um, it seems a silly question now, but um, what Darwin had done in The Origin of Species was to demolish a pair of theological points of view. And so uh, the very famous uh, preacher and professor of theology at Oxford, Edmund Pusey, in a sermon at Oxford, accused, which was then published in The Guardian, accused Darwin of having written this quasi-theological work. And Darwin was furious and denied that he'd written such a thing when, of course, that's exactly what he had done. Um, we can only guess that the reason why he was so uh, sure that he hadn't was that he, his arguments against these religious theories, which I'll come to uh, very shortly, uh, were all couched in scientific terms. He didn't enter the theological debate, and therefore he didn't think he'd written the quasi-theology. But this question of what is science and what is theology continues to dog the issue through the 19th century, as I will see. So today I want to describe the next stage in the development of a, of a major conflict like the one between currently between science and religion, and that is when the ideas that have been worked out among individuals start to become slowly incorporated in or denied by uh, the conventional authority. And I'm going to talk, uh, as uh, Bill said, in part about the Oxford debate of July the 1st, uh, 1860. On the 3rd of July, he, Darwin received this letter, and I'd like to read it to you in part, um, but this is only part. Dear Darwin, I've just come in from our la my last moonlight saunter around Oxford and cannot go to bed without inditing a few letters to you, a few lines to you, my dear Darwin. On Saturday, a paper of a Yankee donkey called Draper on civilization according to Darwinian hypotheses or some such title was being read and it did not mend my temper. However, hearing that Soapy Sam was to answer, I waited to hear the end. The meeting was so large that, large that they had adjourned to the library which was crammed with between 700 and 1,000 people. For all the world was there to hear Sam Oxen, that means Sam Bishop of Oxford, 
Well, Sam Oxen got up and spouted for half an hour with inimitable spirit, ugliness and emptiness and unfairness. He ridiculed you badly. Now, you're all saying to yourself, this, written, this letter was written to Darwin by Thomas Henry Huxley. Well, <laughs> sorry, it wasn't. It was written by Joseph Hooker. And one of the odd things about the debate is that we think that Huxley won. Very probably it was a standoff. But if anybody did win, it was Darwin's other disciple, uh, Joseph Hooker. So let's go on a little bit. Now, this meeting in Oxford in a museum of which I was uh, quite recently the director and where I can assure you a thousand people could not have got into the library reading room, although if they had, no wonder it was a heated debate, literally as well as figuratively. Um, anyway, it would have been probably forgotten completely. Um, for one reason, nobody wrote down what was said, except that there was this pair of sentences that Bill has already told you that have lived on in history, partly because they were remembered by Huxley 30 years later when he wrote his autobiography. As something very rude was said about apes and grandparents, and Huxley replied very rudely himself. So, let's just backtrack a little bit. You all know, I'm sure, that it was, um, nearly two years before the Oxford debate, uh, July the 18th, 1838, I mean 1858, so two years, not 68, um, the, the naturalist Alfred Russell Wallace wrote to Darwin from the Moluccas and said, I've had this brilliant idea, what do you think about this? And there was Darwin's idea that he'd been working on for, 40, for 20 years uh, in a 20-page essay and it caused a huge crisis and, uh, of, of health and everything else, of course, as it always did with, with Darwin. Uh, that was the 18th of June, on the, July the 1st, so exactly two years before the Oxford debate, uh, there was a meeting, hurried meeting of the Linnaean Society in London of which the two, uh, his, Alfred Russell Wallace's paper and a paper hurriedly put together by Darwin uh, were read side by side. Now here you would think this would have been explosive. Not a bit of it. One of the dullest meetings ever held by the Linnaean Society for two reasons. One, well, three. One, people were preoccupied by the death of uh, the famous microscopist uh, Brown, of Brownie in motion. And secondly, the audience only consisted of 30 people, most of whom were Darwinian partisans, and the others probably didn't understand what was explained to them there as just, as they say always about Darwin and evolution, just a theory, no facts to back it up. And there had been lots of theories on evolution before. So this first announcement was a real bit of a dud. In the next two years, Darwin's ideas started to sink in, and then their importance started to become realized. And whether or not it was quasi theology, it certainly was a huge challenge. Now, as you read any book about the early history of evolutionary theory, um, you'll see that the De Oxford debate is the great pivotal moment of uh, the issue. But in fact, by the time of the June meeting in Oxford, 1860, the discussion had been held much more interestingly, a more detailed fashion, uh, in three separate debates, no, in, in no less than uh, our favorite place, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And the heroes of the Massachusetts debates, or the Boston debates, as they usually call, uh, were Asa Gray, professor of botany at Harvard, William Barton Rogers, who was a geologist and founding professor at MIT a couple of years later, and Louis Agassi, who was Gray's colleague as, and professor of zoology at Harvard. Gray and Rogers had one thing in common, which is that they absolutely hated Louis Agassi. And they resented the fact that he had assumed the, pa the position of preeminent naturalist in the, in the Americas, North and South, and also imagined himself the greatest naturalist uh, of the world of his time. And he was certainly a great promoter. Uh, he'd come over to uh, Harvard from, from Switzerland some years ago. 
And he was in the process of founding his great legacy, which is the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard, where many, many, many years ago I studied. They thought he was totally wrong in allowing his wife to run a school for girls uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The school is now called Radcliffe College. But anything that Agassiz did, Gray and Rogers were likely to be opposed to it. So let's just backtrack one more way. What Darwin had done in The Origin of Species was to propose a theory which had three parts. One is that animals and plants naturally vary, that this variation is at least in part heritable, generation to generation to generation, and that life on Earth is one constant horrendous struggle for existence such that if you have a hundred offspring or if you are cod, two million, uh, likely only one or two will survive to replace you. That is the element of his theory. The, this, the second thing uh, is that what he did was to destroy the notion that God had created all of nature, the natural theology movement, um, uh, and that by studying nature, you could see the beauty, purpose, and uh, function, uh, the benign nature of the universe. Um, and clearly, if uh, the, the Earth was, ecology was, as Darwin proposed, uh, one constant warfare, uh, and, uh, and if you try to explain things like disease, war, and pestilence, uh, natural theology didn't work very well, and Darwin really went at that point uh, heavily. The second thing is he attacked this theory of special creation. Now, there were various views of how, the, uh, how, Earth, how life had arisen on Earth. There was the, the view in Genesis that Earth was created over a number of days, that life only on, on three of those, those days. Um, there was uh, a different question was that it was all made extinct anyway. So the key question was what happened after Noah and his ark repopulated the earth. Um, clerics and scientists have sort of gotten together in an uneasy compromise in which they said, well, we'll just ignore that. What we will agree is that God created all life on earth at one instant. We won't specify when or where or how. But this, uh, this creation of life on Earth happened so that it was all created in one place exactly as it is now. So that North American plants and animals were, found, were created in North America. Aboriginals in Australia were created in Australia in this flash, this instant of time. And then you, it was a way of saying where well, you didn't really have to worry about the, any of the details, just focus, concentrate on this theory of special creation. And Darwin destroyed that theory, and that's the one that got him into trouble for the quasi-theology, because uh, it was pretty clear after Darwin that that theory of special creation uh, was not going to fly. And it, it, the evidence for it came from what Darwin was very good at, which was being a naturalist. Uh, for instance, why would God have made a northern chickadee and a southern chickadee on the east coast of the United States, when one chickadee would certainly have done for chickadeeness. And indeed, why are there all those, the family uh, are called titmice, why are there all these uh, other kinds of tits all over the place? There's the blue tit, the great tit, the marsh tit, the long tail tit in England alone. Um, why did, why did God do all that? But he forgot to put the polar bears in the Antarctic or to put penguins in the Arctic. There was no pattern to this creation and no pattern that could be explained by uh, theologian, theologians or scientists. It was just a matter of saying, well, that's what happened. And uh, the other side of this was, why was it that you could, you could see that all these birds like the, the titmice were clearly related to each other, and all the woodpeckers were clearly related to, to each other, and other birds like the hoopoe seem not to be related to anything. But why are these patterns? They are patterns in the mind of God, um, but if they were part of a result of a process, then patterns would be much more explainable. Uh, this is the way Darwin was trying to lead uh, 
people's thinking. So Agassiz was the master of the special creation theory. The standard view was that, for instance, if you took North America, there had been a certain seeding of animals and plants in North America, and then they could spread until they ran into natural barriers like the Rocky Mountains, so they wouldn't go the other side, or they wouldn't go to the east because of the Atlantic, and so on. So that there was some spread, some migration, and some variation. And taking that approach, scientists, including Darwin's old teacher, Henslow, at Cambridge, had worked out there were probably some 60 of these centers where special creation had occurred. Agassiz didn't believe any of that. He didn't believe that there was any migration, that everything was literally instantaneous, that everything was found exactly where it was now. And that actually made his view of special creation rather, rather uh, uh, vulnerable. He also thought that, the, that there was no such thing as variation. And you remember I mentioned the beginning of Darwin's ideas is, is that Organisms vary naturally, and that variation is heritable. In Agassiz's view, there was no variation. And this is, this is one of the hardest things to understand about Agassiz, because clearly everybody now knows that there is tremendous amount of variation um, in every, uh, almost every uh, natural population. And the only way to approach it is that you've got to... Th no use thinking at it in our terms. You've got to think of it in the terms of the... Uh, of the early 19th century, where it all looked, where the same data looked so very different. And that really, to me, is one of the most fascinating things about this. Um, but Agassiz was convinced, for instance, that the human races were not races. They were separate species. An Australian species, an African species, Asian species, European species. And, and this actually made him extremely popular with uh, the, the Southern plantation class that was very uh, uh, well represented at Harvard. And I'm looking desperately for a quote that, uh, oh yes, uh, when he was lecturing in 1860, in April, while these debates that I'm going to talk about in a minute were going on, uh, a man called Edwin Sylvester Morse, who was a, became a great evolutionist himself, and was very uh, instrumental in taking evolutionary theory to Japan, interestingly enough. Spent splendid lecture by Prof this morning, that's Agassiz, on the absurd absurdity of believing that Adam and Eve were the first created and the only ones. It was a masterly lecture and listened to with great attention. See the problem, see the intellectual problem you get into. Um, even if there was a separate Adam and Eve for the aboriginals, aboriginals in Australia, um, they still had to migrate to fill up the continent unless all the aboriginal people were founded at one time, not descendants of one ancestral pair. So that as he worked at his theory, Agassiz found himself constantly bumping into conventional Christian views having to do with religious views, having to do, say, with Adam and Eve. So Agassiz was a bit like Jefferson and a bit like Darwin, sort of tremendously embattled within himself with this theory that he wanted to impose on everybody else, and in a way was a, a target sort of ripe for plucking uh, when Darwinism came along. So what actually happened in these debates? Well, Asa Gray had traveled extensively in Europe and met all the famous scientists, including young, then a very young man, Joseph Hooker, the botanist, later became director of Kew at that time in the 1830s. His father was the director of Kew Gardens in, in London. And he was very familiar with the British scientists and in 1855 got into conversation, uh, correspondence with Charles Darwin. Darwin wanted to know about variation in animals and plants and Gray was the great expert on variation in plants and their distribution over time. So Darwin was in the process of 
organizing a little political support for himself so that when he eventually launched his theory on the world, it wouldn't just drop into a complete vacuum. He would have all the possible reviewers, for instance, for the major magazines and newspapers converted to his point of view. So he spent about five years from 1855 to 1860 being very political, having little political weekend dinner parties at, at Down House where he persuaded people of his point of view. It's a very concerted, deliberate, and very sensible uh, strategy for launching onto the world such a, a radical theory. And he had sent a copy of his, his, an outline of his ideas to Asa Gray in 1857. So Gray knew all about Darwinism uh, then and was certainly the first American uh, to know about it and one of only, say, 20 people in the whole world who knew what Darwin was thinking about. Well, this turned out to be quite useful when Alfred Russell Wallace came up with his idea and launched it, uh, dropped it on Darwin's lap because Darwin needs to be able to show the, his own priority for this idea. And then he could turn to people like Asa Gray and say, well, <clears throat> yes, you see, Professor Gray had a copy of my theory in, in 1857. So it all, that all worked out rather nicely. Uh, but it also worked out very well for Gray himself because he was in the process of becoming almost sort of independently a Darwinian from his own research. He had been studying the flora of Japan. And uh, in, the, in 1853, I think it was, he was given a huge collection of plants that had been made in Japan to study uh, at Harvard. And he discovered something extraordinarily interesting. And he wrote a long memoir of it for the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which was published in 1859 and includes on the last few pages a little essay on how his discoveries uh, supported a Darwinian view of things and, and vice versa. So what had he discovered? He discovered a remarkable fact about the botany of uh, Japan and the southeast of the United States. And it's exactly the opposite of what you would ever think but there are lots and lots of species of plants, trees particularly, and bushes, herbs and whatnot, that are in common between the southeast, like Georgia, and Japan, and not found anywhere else living in the United States. This is now known quite well to botanists, and uh, Gray was the one who discovered it. For instance, um, you probably are familiar with the, the Camellia family, which is an Asian family. It has two representatives, well, three actually, in the south southeast United States, Gordonia, Stuartia, and Franklinia, which are all three really beautiful trees with a lovely scent. Uh, for those people who are genetically disposed to be able to smell it, I'm one who cannot. Um, but these are camellias, and they're not found anywhere else in the United States, but they are found in Eastern Asia. So how are you to explain this? Well, it simply didn't work with the theory of special creation. If you think about it, either there had been one center, which included Japan and Southeast Asia, and Southeast United States, but not the rest of the United States, uh, or there had been two centers producing the same species. In both cases, Agassiz's theory was up a gum tree. And Agassi was very, uh, Gray was very happy to point this out. So the first unveiling of Gray's work was December the 18th, uh, December the 10th, 1858. So still 18 months before the Oxford debate. And he gave a talk at the Cambridge Scientific Club, which met in people's houses, was a dining club. And he talked about Darwin's theory that had been in the Linnaean Society uh, meeting. And just like the Linnaean Society meeting, it was, a f it, it was just flat. No one knew what to do with it. Agassiz was present. He didn't complain. It was just sort of there, something too difficult to deal with. So then Gray went to work. And on December the 18th, at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, 
This sounds, sounds very uh, fine. Actually, they were meeting in his father-in-law's house. Um, he started to present his work on the Japanese botany and the Southeast Asia. And it went on uh, through, the, uh, through the rest of the, of the spring into the early summer. And it was quite clear to everybody that the evidence was overwhelming that there was this extraordinary uh, distribution. And Gray explained it in terms of the one thing that could be most irritating to Agassiz, which is in terms of glaciation. Now, Agassiz had burst on the world as a scientist in 1837 why, by his theory of jet glaciation, which explained uh, all the evidence that previously people had thought of was evidence of the Great Flood, all that sand, gravel, terminal moraines, and whatnot. He thought with water, yes, but, but ice. And so the reason why you have these things in Southeast United States and in Japan is once you had a coterminous distribution of plants, the glaciers came down and split the whole area in two, so these were now relics, and then the glaciers retreated, but they are still stuck as relics. So he actually used Agassiz's theory against himself, which was uh, very clever. And he invoked there had to be lots and lots of climate change, which would uh, go along with the glaciation, something else that, uh, that the theory of special creation explicitly denied. So he was doing what Darwin was going to do in The Origin of Species, but he did it much earlier in the sense of attacking effectively the theory of special creation. So not much happened then until the beginning of 1860 when copies of The Origin of Species started to arrive in the United States. It was published in October of 1859, so it didn't, took six weeks or so and people had got it. And now the American Academy of Arts and Sciences took the debate up all over again. And this time the uh, special creation people took the offensive and put the Darwinians on the back foot. Leaving Gray this time, instead of being leading the charge, making a very much of a, of a, a rear guard uh, discussion uh, defense of uh, Darwinism, when a remarkable thing happened. The chairman of the meeting decided that it was possible to make the special creation of Agassiz and the natural selection of Darwin actually fit together. It wasn't so very difficult. It's, it's so, it, this, is, this is a sort of the Rosetta Stone of, of uh, science and religion, if you like. And in doing so, he let the cat out of the bag completely because this was his, remark, his concluding remark. If we suppose that the time had come for a dog to exist for the first time, and become the father of all dogs. It is far too easier to believe that he was born of a wolf, a fox, a hyena, or a jackal, than that he suddenly flashed into existence out of nothing or a few pounds of chemical elements. The very defender of Agassiz had uh, turned on him at the last minute. The next thing is that Gray, one of the very important parts of, of Agassiz's theory was that no species living today existed before Pleistocene times. And this was the old argument about human fossils, of course. In those days, there were no pre-Pleistocene fossils, no pre-flood fossils. And it was thought in theory impossible that there, that there would be. Uh, so that all the fossil animals belong to elements of special creation that had happened further and further back in time, exactly duplicating the, ones, the last one that we, we all represent. Um, so Gray and his botanists were very, it was very easy for them to show that there were lots of species living today that were present in the Miocene. Plants are, are much better at this than animals are, the um, Pliocene. And, uh, to this now, uh, Agassiz really had no uh, uh, answer. The meeting was taken up at the Boston Natural History Society, and now Agassiz was on the offensive, and he was saying that Darwin's theory was contradicted by the geological record. 
And that's when William Barton Rogers jumped on him. So this is, this is really, it's, it, I'm making it sound as though it was rather aggressive, but it was all frightfully refined and they're sitting around sipping sherry in each other's living rooms while this is going on. So Agassiz had thought that the great series of sedimentary rocks of the Paleozoic of the East in the United States had been laid down in a deep sea. And Darwin, Rogers, and Charles Lyell all thought that they'd been laid down in a shallow sea which subsided. And Rogers presented the evidence and Agassiz agreed. And for the first time, gave in to his critics. By six months from then, he no longer talked about evolution in any scientific works, though he tended to talk privately about it. He had been totally defeated by Gray and by Rogers. It was quite remarkable sitting quietly in these three sets of meetings occurring in a period of about 18 months. So this is actually much more exciting in a way, although frightfully dull, um, than the <laughs> Oxford meeting, which was very exciting, but also, no, actually, it'll put it the other way, rather dull, but somehow has become exciting. What's interesting is that in all these debates, Agassiz, who was defending the theological point of view, never once mentioned a theological argument. Gray, who should have been the anti-theological type, was a staunch Presbyterian, had a theological argument. <laughs> Go back again. Darwin's theory is that there is this variation which is inherited and fought over in the struggle for existence. Gray had a brilliant insight. The variation is not random, but is directed by the Almighty. So then everybody's happy. Except that he had said earlier, why would we suppose the Creator to do supernaturally that which would naturally be affected by the very instrumentalities that he has set in motion? That is, if you set the laws of, mo of matter in motion, uh, why interfere with it at the very last minute? Why wouldn't the special creation theory be better? A stalemate, but one that persisted for almost the rest of the century in many quarters, the idea that you could make everybody happy by assuming that the variation was not random. And it was really only solved at the, at the turn of the century by the rediscovery of, of genetics and mutation and so on. So those words of Gray's, why should we suppose the creator to do supernaturally that which he could already set into operation, actually brings us back to Oxford because at almost exactly the same time as Gray was, was saying that, uh, the same words were being uttered by the professor of geometry at Oxford, a man named the Reverend Baden Powell. Uh, in this case, interesting enough, Baden is the first name. Baden Powell, the founder of uh, scouting, was either his son or nephew, and they took the name as, as hyphenated, but his name was Professor Powell, Professor B. Powell. And Baden-Powell wrote this wonderful book in 1859 called The Order of Nature Considered in Reference to Claims of Revelation, in which he just resolutely denied that there could possibly be such a thing as miracles, and that, if I may quote, and this is before he knows anything about Darwin, it is absurd to argue that the introduction of new forms of life or new species of organic beings in successive epochs of the Earth formation involves a peculiar mysterious power or supernatural creation merely because we do not at present know the cause of life or see the species arise before our eyes, which, it may be added, we could never detect as such if they did. And that, if you remember, is one of the great arguments against Darwinian evolution, that if it happens, why don't we see species evolving all the time? And Baden-Powell points out that you probably wouldn't detect them if they did. So <clears throat> Darwin's theory, as you can see by this distinguished cleric uh, mathematician at Oxford, from his writing, you see that Darwin's theory arrived in Britain at a very, very convenient time. It was a perfect time for Darwin, at least. He 
The geologists had worked out the world was extremely old, and Darwin needed a great deal of time for his uh, natural selection to work huge changes with very tiny little uh, differences in variation. And the Church of England had started to turn on itself in a series of rending, rending debates uh, over how much of this new science should be incorporated in teaching and in church dogma. And Baden-Powell was one of the people at the head of this charge. And two months after The Origin of Species was published, this other book was published, which sold many more copies, was much more influential than The Origin of Species, and it was called Essays and Reviews. And I think I've referred to it before, and I will be referring to it again. Essays and Reviews was a series of essays by seven clerics, uh, liberal, uh, although you, they would have said moderate, uh, clerics, um, arguing for a revised way of, you look, of looking at the way science impo imposes itself on conventional uh, li uh, religious theory. And in his essay in Essays and Reviews, after his, a year after his first book, Baden-Powell becomes the first cleric in Britain to endorse Darwin's theory directly. But at the time, Essays and Reviews was much more controversial because it had long expositions of the way in which German philosophers and philologists had shown that the Bible, and particularly Genesis, was basically a series of fables rather than an lit account literally dictated uh, to Moses, uh, that it involves two, possibly more, we, people now think four, separate literary traditions. And that a lot, great deal depended on how you, you translated the words that in uh, the English Bible are down as made or created. Uh, one could mean made out of nothing, created could mean built out of something that already existed. This, these arguments were incredibly uh, difficult and, and uh, uh, argumentative in, in, in the middle of the 19th century. So this is a long way, long-winded way of saying, is that all this was going on just at the time that Darwin's theory uh, was published and a heaven-sent opportunity came to Bishop Samuel Wil Wilberforce to cut all this nonsense off at the knees and stop it right there before it got any worse. The essays and reviews nonsense, all that liberal thinking, and all this terrible Darwinism stuff can be fixed because God had given him, as it were, a tremendous opportunity. The University, Oxford University, had decided to build this wonderful museum, which was going to be a secular temple to nature. It's guiding spirit with the artist John Ruskin, and it is, in fact, you, you have to go visit. It's the most extraordinary uh, piece of Gothic uh, architecture with its incredible glass roof, which leaks, but it's being fixed. Um, it's leaked for 140, 152 years, but as we very speak, it's being fixed. Um, there was going to, they, so the British Association for the Advancement Science would have its annual meeting at Oxford to celebrate this wonderful building. And who would be the local chairman of the British Association meetings? Sam Wilberforce, who had a first degree in mathematics, so he was no slouch. And so, for several days, everybody came to Oxford and talked about the latest research in science all over, but hanging over everything was Darwin's new theory. Okay, so there were 200 papers presented at the, the, at the, at the British Association meetings, but the big deal was the Saturday morning. I'm going to start with the Saturday morning, then I have to go back to the Thursday before. Thursday, Saturday morning, a man called John Draper, a donkey of a man, as, as, as Hooker described him, he was a chemist, he, a translated Englishman who had taught, was professor of chemistry at NYU. And he gave a long paper, apparently rather too long, and not well received at all, described as boring and dull, 
about, which was essentially the invention of social Darwinism. And he described how, the civil, how European civilizations could be, be analyzed as going through evolutionary phases in their history. And he later wrote a long, very interesting book on the subject, but it was extremely badly received at the time. Uh, which is ironic because he later wrote this book called History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science, which became the book, the most influential book in this whole business of the conflict between science and religion, um, of which the Oxford debate seems to be such a pivotal, pivotal moment. Anyway, so Draper gave his talk, and Samuel Wilberforce got up and decided to savage Darwin. He essentially ignored uh, Draper. So he launched into a great criticism of Darwin, and uh, he may or may not have ended by turning, uh, let us single out my friend Miles Alderman, saying, and tell us, Dr. Huxley, is it from your grandmother or your grandfather's side that you claim descent from an ape? Now, if you think about it, could the Bishop of Oxford actually have said that? I mean, it's amazing. So Huxley got up, and Huxley was then not a very good speaker. In fact, it was that debate that made him learn how to be an effective public speaker, and he then became Darwin's bulldog, but at this time, wasn't so good. But he did say something like, he would rather be descended from an ape than associated with a man who used his great gifts to distort the truth. So, translating this, Wilbur Corse had call, called Huxley a son of a bitch, and Huxley had called him a liar. It, is that really possible? It doesn't seem right for Victorian England and a, an audience of maybe 400 people, 300 of whom were, were clerics. Anyway. In the mythic account of this debate, the evolutionists were really ready for, Hux for Wilbercross, and Huxley was primed to go after him. That wasn't true at all. He was going home the day of the, mo the morning of the meeting, and he was persuaded at the last minute to go because it was sort of his duty to, to go and listen to Sam and see if he could do something in the way of damage control. It was... Joseph Hooker, who really thought that he had uh, won the debate. But since no one wrote down what they said, it's very difficult to know who won and who didn't win. What we, what we do know from some newspaper reports is that, Huxley, uh, that Wilberforce, Wilberforce went through a rather pedestrian, to us, uh, uh, attack of Darwinism. For instance, pointing out that there had been no evolution because the Egyptian mummies and birds that had been found uh, were exactly the same species as exist today. And they were the oldest things that you could imagine, especially if you thought the world was only 6,000 years old. But he did launch into an attack on the great weakness of Darwin's theory, which is the business of variation. And Hooker knew about Gray's work, and so he was able, rather than Huxley, to attack that. So this is what I'm going to now read, the continuation of Hooker's letter to Darwin. Where is it? Sorry. So Sam Oxen got up and spouted for half an hour with inimitable spirit, ugliness, and emptiness and unfairness. That, we're at that part of the letter. He ridiculed you badly and Huxley savagely. Huxley answered admirably and turned the tables, but he could not throw his voice over so large an assembly nor command the audience. Now I saw my advantage. I swore to myself I would smite that Amalekite, Sam, hip and thigh, and there and then I smashed him among, amid rounds of applause. Sam was shut up, had not one word to say in reply, and the meeting was dissolved forthwith, leaving you, Darwin, Master of the field after four hours battle, I have been congratulated and thanked by the blackest coats and whitest stocks in Oxford. What Hooker had done was point out rather cleverly that Wilberforce, Wilberforce had been attacking the wrong theory. 
he had, this is the one thing we know from, from a magazine called the Athenaeum, which gave an account of the, uh, of the debate, a little bit of an account, that Wilberforce, Wilberforce had apparently been attacking uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck's transmutation theory, where whole species were progressively turned into the next species and the next species, whereas Darwinian, Darwinian theory has divergence from part of a species and so on. And so uh, one of the ways that Hooker salvaged uh, Wilberforce was, was to go after him for having, having gone after the wrong theory. So where did this business of the monkey come from? So it turns out that on the Thursday afternoon, there had been a, a paper by Richard Owen on the differences between the brains of a, a man, on a, a human, and a gorilla. And he tried to present this as though the gorilla brain and the human brain were incredibly different from each other. And when he obviously knew that was not true. And Huxley certainly knew it was not true. And said so. And there, a huge row developed on the Thursday, starting with this, and I like this one, Huxley saying he didn't want to, once again, reluctant. Huxley didn't want to get into this because a general audience in which sentiment would duly interfere with intellect was not the public before which such a, such a discussion should be carried on. And then he just tore Owen apart. But in the process said something like, you know, I'm not ashamed of the fact that I'm descended from apes. That's why Wilberforce then could turn to him and say, remind us, Professor Huxley, but it's the business about the grandmother and the grandfather that bothers me. So let me just wrap this up fairly quickly. There are lots and lots of provincial newspapers that covered the debate, and none of them mention uh, apes for ancestors at all. Um, there is one letter that went to the Morning Chronicle in London, <clears throat> and I will read you this. Nothing has been so striking so, or nor so neatly pro proposed as the Bishop of Oxford's question to Mr. Huxley, whether in the yet stakey, shaky state of the law of development as laid down by Darwin, anyone can be so enamored of this so-called law or hypothesis as to go into jubilation for his great-great-grandfather having been an ape or gorilla. So that sounds as though it did happen. But the Glasgow Herald, of all places, has a different view. The Bishop of Oxford, with all the authoritarian dogmatism of the episcopate, denounced the idea that the progress of organisms is determined by law. It was absurd. Although he allowed that to any sensible man, it was of little consequence to himself whether his grandfather might be called a monkey or not. So here's an entirely different in, uh, spin of this. In the one case, you have a really nasty, sarcastic attack, and the other one, you have supercilious indifference. Now, of all the bishops of Oxford that I have ever come across, supercilious indifference seems to be much more likely than the sarcasm. <laughs> but in the end, we'll never know what was said. But if he really did say it, then it is certainly no surprise that Lady Brewster fainted. Lady Brewster is famous. Um, she occurs nowhere else in history except for fainting at the Oxford debate. Uh, she was the wife of a very famous philosopher, how Sir David Brewster. So, sort of jokes aside, the interesting thing about, one interesting thing about this debate is, and this has been raised by historians of science, was this a debate about two, the Oxford debate, about two kinds of science, like the American debates were, or was it about two views of, of theology? A special creation theory, or the sort of deism that Darwin uh, was left with Darwin when you, you leave God as the original creator of the earth and uh, then the creator of the laws, which then just ran like clockwork to run by themselves. Theology or science, it was actually both because the core of it is not an, a, a series of appeals to individual conscience or reason, but to authority, 
all the way through these debates, you are really having debates about authority. Agassiz's authority. Gray wanting to usurp his authority. Wilberforce defending the authority of the Church of England. Huxley and Hooker trying to develop the, defend the authority of a new kind of science. So they make wonderful theater, especially because we don't know what was said. Um, the theme is always giants brought low by uh, bluster and dogmatism being overwhelmed by new facts and logic. Um, but we shouldn't have Im forget this immense personal side that is in here. This is where the individuals still appear in this process of science and religion being in conflict. Uh, we're just seeing the process of uh, what individuals think becoming translated into what uh, authority uh, takes over. So the debates can be seen as two sets of way stations, if you like, in a long and continued intellectual journey, journey in which religious authority was replaced by a complex mixture of secular, non-scientific, and scientific authority. At first, and especially after the Wilberforce debate, nothing changed, and yet everything had. And if nothing else, for one issue of profound importance, Darwin theorized, and paleontologists soon showed, that man was not a special creation, but in fact descended from apes. Copernicus removed the earth from the center of the universe. Darwin gave humans a pedigree and translated God from being the special creator to the giver only of the initial laws of matter. But it's important to remember that the Darwinian revolution, if you like, arose alongside an immense array of other factors that can't be ignored. Industrialization of society, new political, economic, and even legal philosophies, increases in every kind of personal freedom, startling discoveries about the cosmos, and with those came whole movements in society involving change. And that is what evolution is about. It is about change uh, and revolution against all kinds of authority. So these debates are a, a little snapshot of what's going on throughout society any, everywhere when new knowledge and new attitudes come into old authorities' territory. What is not to be questioned is that with each loss or change of authority, new doubts arose as well as new certainties. Whatever conflicts may have arisen or persisted between elements of science and religion in, say, 1860, they were part of a much wider picture of change. And in the process of change, both religion and science have had to think seriously about what their new roles should be. Perhaps not enough. And that's what we'll talk about in the next lecture. Thank you. For, for those of you who would like to ask questions, we have two microphones here so that the rest of us can uh, hear what you, you have to, to say and ask. Uh, Hello. That was wonderful. Um, two things. Um, it's my impression that the idea of evolution had been around for some time. Yes. Darwin's own grandfather had written of it. Precisely. And, yeah. and the significant thing was the idea of natural selection. That's correct, yes. Not evolution, but evolution by natural selection. That's absolutely right. Um, Darwin's grandfather was, well, it actually goes back to classical times, the notion that things might be related by descent. Uh, Erasmus Darwin was the first to propose it, and he actually also proposed the notion that artificial selection, animal and plant breeding, would be a model for this. And that's the first item that Darwin copied into his first notebook on transmutation, as he called it. Um, but yes, and, and that is, I think that's why when the, in, in both, uh, in the Linnaean Society and in the, if I remember rightly, the Cambridge Scientific Society meetings, it didn't cause a great sensation because, oh, there'd always people thinking about ideas of solution. The, the trick is to persuade me that any one of them might be true. 
And so it wasn't until the book came out that there was any real uh, necessity to, to take this particularly seriously. But the, you touch on another point, which I think is interesting. We tend to say evolution, or sometimes evolution, um, as a synonym for natural selection, and that is, that is quite incorrect. Darwinian, the word Darwinian theory of evolution is a theory of natural selection. Or evolution by natural selection. Or evolution by, yes. Since, yes. since there are other means, there's artificial, exactly. there's sexual, and yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. So the other thing is I think there's a, always a misuse of it's only a theory. <laughs> a, a hypothesis is something for which there is no evidence. And you exactly. have an idea. Yes. And then you do some experiment. Yes. The theory is what we all do in the laboratory here. 99% of the scientific work today deals with theories, where we have some ideas, we have some data, and we're trying to sharpen up our idea of what we think it is, hardly ever a, a law. We're always, we're, we're always polishing up our, our, our ideas. Um, yes. And I, I don't think that, I think that's a misuse of those words. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's just, it's grown up since the 1860s, but there was a nice article in the New York Times by, I think, Nicholas Wade. Was it Nicholas Wade, sweetie? Um, on this very point. Um, Einstein's theory of relativity is, is a theory, uh, constantly tested. Um, uh, Agassiz's theory of, of glacial, glacial action was a theory. I mean, it's just, it's just one of these locutions that's, that's developed, but has left the whole subject open to criticism because it seems like a weakness, whereas we know it's just, that's the way it is in the scientific world because everything is in, in the end falsifiable at some point or other. Um, mm -hmm. and, the, and we've made it much worse because there's another locution which is just as bad, which is you, people say they believe in evolution when it means they accept, they understand, or they follow, but to say they believe in evolution, or to say they believe in the theory of evolution, it's so wishy-washy, wishy it's, I mean. <laughs> what should easy. they say? They should say they accept, mm -hmm. or they work with, or mm -hmm. they understand, uh, but basically you say I accept. So, uh, I'm not all the way over with Dawkins, but I would often, say to people on the other side, the hypothesis of God. The hypothesis, <laughs> well, as you said, the, 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 the difference between the hypothesis and the theory is, is There's no is, evidence is, is immense. for a hypothesis. Yeah. And, uh, and I sh I'm sure you know, a great example of that is the Pope originally, I mean, in, in this, I was gonna say this century, shows how old I am. Um, in the last 50 years, has allowed that the theory of evolution is to be considered a, that, that natural selection is to be considered a theory and no longer an hypothesis, a very distinct dif difference that was made by the Catholic Church, which was a very important one for science. Um, the difference between a hypothesis and a theory is, is essential. Could you remind us for how he changed the last sentence or two, uh, or between the additions? Oh, yes. Um, well, to get it right, I'll, I'll actually find it for you. Um, so the question is, what did Darwin actually do to the origin of species um, at the very last minute? Um, sorry. You... Okay, so you have to remember. Ah. The, the last paragraph of The Origin of Species is one of the most glorious pieces of writing in scientific writing. Um, Thus from the war of nature, from famine and death. See, there, there's the snide remark about natural theology right there. Thus from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of higher animals, directly follows. There is grandeur in this view of life, 
with its several powers, having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that while this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity from so simple a beginning, endless forms so beautiful and most wonderful, most beautiful actually, and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. The key phrase is, there is a grandeur in this view of life originally breathed into a few forms or one. And Darwin changed it. This view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed by the creator into a few forms or one. It's one of those things like so often, it seems so simple and, and unimportant. And he bitterly resented having given in to uh, the pressure most, most uh, probably most severely felt in his household because his wife was such an ardent believer. And you can just see him saying, well, it's no, no, there's, there's no harm. There's no harm in doing this. So let's do it. And then saying, oh, what have I done? And it's sort of like, uh, it's like Galileo reading Copernicus backwards, isn't it? I mean, anyway, yes, this is, are there other questions before we go and get a, uh, yes. Right. Oh. Um, I have mostly a comment um, using your own chronology with Jefferson as a physical scientist um, and Darwin as a biological science, it seems that um, initially this, the schism between religion and w Western religion, I guess, and science is more of a physical science uh, not able to come to terms, physical science, and then you get into biological science. <clears throat> a much more severe schism that we still, to this day, we cannot repair. Easy to say things are pushed around by glaciers, et cetera, and then, then, then say that, well, humans came from, the supreme beings came from. Yeah, um, actually, I disagree. I mean, it, the, the, timing is, the timing is such. Um, it's a bit like um, the, the, the view of how the sciences develop, the physical sciences, then the, uh, the chem that was physics, chemistry, biology last because it's, it's most difficult. But I think if we were around in the 17th century, we would not have thought that the biological problems were, and could check, <laughs> that we would think the problems with biology today were any more severe than the problems with cosmology then. I, 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 really, don't, I really don't think so. Um, but I, I do think they're, the, they're exactly the same class, uh, uh, class of problem. And it's, the problem becomes acute when, you, when enough new knowledge is able to really make a dent in the authority that it bumps into. And the science is developed in this strange sequential way. Um, so the, next, the question will be, what is the next one that's going to cause a huge uh, crash in the, in the intellectual world? And it, may have something to do with dark energy, I think. <laughs> but not in my time. <laughs> anyway, sorry. What I'd like to do is uh, separate religion from, uh, from what the Bible says, because religion, uh, everybody, you cannot change what people believe, what they think. Uh, all you can do is maybe show them something and they have to make the change. But I think um, when we look at the Bible, you mentioned the earth was created in some days. Uh, the Bible says in the beginning, in Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't say when that was, a million, a billion, a trillion years ago. But when it starts separating the light from the darkness and the waters from the waters, each day it says there came to be an evening, there came to be a morning, a first day. They came to be an evening, a morning, a second day. All the way up to the sixth day, it says there came to be an evening, they came to be a morning, the sixth day, and God proceeded to rest on the seventh day. Now we read from other scriptures that God is still resting. 
thousands of years later, and it talks about some that will enter into that rest. So we can see, also when it talks about the six days, it says, this is the history of the heavens and the earth in the day when God created them. So we can see that it's not 24 hours, it's a period of time. And most likely, separating the light from the darkness was six or 7,000 years in length. They didn't do it like that. Just like when we do an areostat here. We don't turn the lights on and off. And separating the waters. So when we look at it that way, and we start examining the Bible, we come to find that it is in agreement with proved science. Even going to the moon, we had to know that within our atmosphere, there's a temperature range of around 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And we all know what happened to one of the spacecrafts coming back when it wasn't insulated properly. And we start looking what the Bible says, talks about this when he separated the waters from the waters. Above the earth came to be the expanse, and below, below the earth came to be the seas. And when we start examining these things, we come to find that the Bible is in agreement with proved science, not what religion says, though. Well, so. this, this, this is a debate that was held in, in, in huge detail in, in the, between 1800 and 1900, really. Um, and this is what the, that the major essay in Essays and Reviews uh, 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 attacked, because the German philologists had looked very carefully at what the Bible says and what it could mean. And you're certainly right. One of the things that everybody agreed on very early was that it didn't preclude there having been an immense period of time before God created the, because of the word created. If he created it out of nothing, then the instant he created it, that's when time began. If he created it out of something, then there could be an immense period of time before that. And people have spent a long time trying to match up the timing of the first chapter of Genesis with uh, the geological record. Uh, for instance, the three days of cre uh, when life is actually created uh, for years was, was tried to match up with the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic eras. Um, but it, it never, it, it, it's never fully satisfying to people because um, you, for instance, have the creeping things before the plants, which they would certainly have eaten. You have the... Uh, I've, I've forgotten what the wording is. Um, but anyway, you finish up with light and dark before the creation of the sun. And, and, and there, there, was, there are so many inconsistencies that <clears throat> you have to ask yourself, what are we trying to accomplish here? Are we trying to show that what is written in the book of Genesis, and particularly as translated in the King James Version, are we trying to show that that is the literal truth of something? Or are we trying to show that it is a remarkable folk history of what we now know to be uh, from, from all of science and everything? I mean, if you look at it that way, it's actually it's a remarkable document, Genesis, because it doesn't say, for instance, that uh, there were humans before the, the sun and the moon were made and whatnot. Um, so, but it's like all the other folk histories of creation, creation myths of the Navajo or the Ab Ab Aboriginal, Australian Aboriginals with the dream time and whatnot. Um, if you want to make it a literally dictated by God to Moses, then the internal consistencies destroy it. If you want to, if one, I don't mean you personally, but you might, but um, uh, if, if one wants to make it a, a fascinating account of, uh, of um, a fascinating putting together of a story of what might have happened that has turned out to be really quite interesting in terms of sequ its sequentiality, then, then it's, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's quite fun. And there is absolutely no limit to the amount of time that can be spent debating the finest points of uh, each word of uh, the King James Version, particularly because you, you really have to do the Hebrew first. 
But thank you for your point. I, 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 it's a very interesting one. Uh, I, I think I will uh, exert a limit on this uh, discussion. Okay. <laughs> and ask you all to adjourn uh, with us to the uh, room at the end of the hall and then continue the informal discussions. Thank you.